Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is incredible to be at the Purdue University Black Cultural Center for the closing reception of Dr. Kendara <laughs> Taylor Watson's African Prints and Conversation Exhibition. I first connected with um, Kadari on Instagram where she began a conversation with me about the traditional Ghanaian uh, woven textile batikari which I'm wearing. We continued the conversation over lunch at a small restaurant in a suburb of Accra, Ghana last summer, and now here we are today. I want to thank Kadari for the honor of inviting me to continue our discussion here with you. I stand here not as an expert on African textiles, but a lover of the genius and artistry of fabrics made and adapted on the continent and as an accidental student. When I was researching my forthcoming children's book about the history of the color blue, I found myself gathering information about ancient dyeing techniques from Indonesia to Nigeria. My research soon expanded beyond the color blue, and I started, and I, I'm sorry, excuse me, De and developing like an old film negative, like no um, the knowledge I've been tangentially acquiring on textile sourcing trips as the co-founder of Exit 14, the line that, as Kadari mentioned, my mother, my sister, and I started two years ago. We're primarily using Ghanaian um, textile batakari, which is native to Ghana's northernmost regions. I've also been acquiring knowledge over the years as a very nerdy textile tourist. <laughs> no vacation for me is completely without a stop at a textile market. To prepare for this lecture specifically, I drew on this knowledge and I referred to Sven Beckert's Empire of Cotton, A Global History, and, which was an instrumental recommendation by my friend and fellow textile fanatic, Joel, Joellen Nicholson. I also referenced Catherine E. McKinley's memoir, Indigo, In Search of the Color That Seduced the World, Roy Sieber's African Textiles and Decorative Arts, and then there's a website called ibike.org that does, has a beautiful overview of textiles in Africa, as well as wildtussa.com's The History of Weaving. Christopher D. Roy's essay, The Art of Burkina Faso, is also helpful. Charles Amoni's paper, Strangers Everywhere, Exclusion, Identity, and the Future of Nubians in, the North, in Northern Uganda, and the paper, Smock Fashion Culture in Ghana's Dress Identity Making, by Uswani Kweku Isel, and Emmanuel R.K. Emisa, which you can find on artwatchgana.org. This mic by you. This is me. So in the spirit of conversation, um, I have to admit, when I think of my eight-year-old self, I can't believe that she's here wearing a dress made of batakari speaking to you on this topic. When I was a kid growing up in Queens, New York, I did not appreciate the craftsmanship involved in looming the Ghanaian kente cloth or designing the cotton print my father would wear to funerals. The fabric draped diagonally across his torso. Nor did I understand the fortitude it took to wear the wood soles on Hanima slippers that went with his look. Likewise, I did not respect the artisanship involved in folding, tucking, and shaping the gele head pieces from Nigeria that my mother used to sell out of our Lefrak City apartment to the local Ghanaian community. It was the 80s in America, and news of the Ethiopian famine seemed to be the only representation of Africa on television, along with appeals for donations of 70 cents a day to, stay, to save starving African children. Mm -hmm. Charity fundraisers like the Live Aid concert and the We Are the World song by USA for Africa put the continent of my parents' birth in the glare of the world's pity, universalizing Africa's troubles, even as I and most of the globe remain ignorant to the nuanced issues facing the 54 countries that make up Africa, or how European colonialism and the American and American foreign intervention helped destabilize the continent and set up the conditions that well-meaning organizations and celebrities were raising money to alleviate. Throughout this period, it was not uncommon for my playground peers to call me an African booty scratcher. At the axis of this parade of pity, poverty, and put-downs, even in spite of the pride my parents rigorously attempted to instill, I felt ashamed of my Ghanaian heritage, and I was fully, willfully ignorant of it. That began to change in 1990, when my parents sent me to live in school in Ghana. I lived with my grandmother, and one of my most enduring memories of that time is Grandma standing in front of her wooden wardrobe and spreading her arms like Diana Ross's character in Mahogany, <laughs> deciding which of the endless options of custom-sewn wax print cloth she would wear to work. At the secondary school I attended in Ghana's central region, 
was respectively about 30 to 35 miles outside Cape Coast in Elmina, where slave dungeons still hold up British and Portuguese castle forts. Part of the uniform was a chapel fort, <coughs> custom stenciled with the school logo and motto, and custom sewn to my measurements. On the school's annual speech day, we were required to wear white kaba blouses and maxi-length kente slit skirts. During my tenure there, we did not have custom-designed cloth for each house yet, but depending on the dormitory block we lived in, we were assigned a color of checked cotton house dresses to wear that made it easy for staff and fellow students to identify which house we belonged to. It was common for a senior or a teacher to shout from afar, hey, Scotton House girl, come, or Engman House girl. The uniforms were shorthand for our identity. Our subsequent trips to Ghana, as an, on subsequent trips to Ghana as an adult, at least once a year since 2001, I began to recognize this as a feature of my culture. This use of fabric to broadcast affiliation with a specific group. Employees in certain companies wore cotton uniforms, custom stencils with the institution's logo. Women's groups from certain churches had custom cloth, as did members of political parties. There were also commemorative cloths. When President John Atta Mills died during his term in office in 2012, textiles bearing his face were sold in the market as collector's items. The same was the case when President Obama was elected and when he later visited Ghana. In my family, when there was a wedding or a funeral, we were assigned a cloth to wear, or one was custom woven for the occasion, so everyone would know who we were. I also learned that the specific colors worn to Ghanaian funerals were coded with meaning. Red and black was the dress code for the death of dignitaries, black and or brown for someone who died an untimely death, and white to celebrate the life of someone who made it to old age. It was then that I understood why my mother forbade us to wear black as children. Mm -hmm. Textiles were used to broadcast status, position, and rank, underpinning a society that strives on stratification and classism. Fabric was also an indicator of where one came from. There were styles of kente that were typical to the Asante people and patterns particular to the Ewes. Likewise, in southern Ghana, anyone wearing a woven smock was immediately recognized as a northerner. That would change over time. With increased migration, made easier by the advent of regular bus service and daily flights between the north and south, it's not just northerners wearing Batakari anymore. And similarly, with international brands and retailers sourcing fabrics and inspiration from the continent, and the international blockbuster Black, Pan blockbuster Black Panther, putting the formerly niche Afro-futurist movement squarely in the zeitgeist. It's not just people from Ghana wearing Batakari or Kente, or people from Mali wearing mud claw, or people from Africa wearing wax prints. Moreover, a new generation of designers are reimagining traditional styles into possibilities previously unknown. Contact with and exposure to different peoples and cultures has always influenced fashion. And in the next few minutes, I'll be focusing on how African textile traditions have specifically been affected. So I've broken down the talk into three sections. Contact, how globalization, migration, colonialism, and pop culture have impacted um, traditional textile design and manufacturing and continue to. I'll spend most of my time on this. And then ownership. With movement and adaptation between the borders comes the question, who is the rightful owner of a specific textile tradition? And who is an appropriator? And then finally, the XX factor. Traditionally, there are gendered roles in the design and manufacture of specific African textiles, but contact with other cultures and economic realities has evolved the roles women and men play, and, and, and even who gets to wear the finished style. So what does this mean for the tradition that spawned the textile in the first place? Traditionally, Adore cloth from Nigeria, Kikoi from Kenya and Tanzania, Bogolanfini, which is known as mud cloth from Mali, Shweshwe cloth from South Africa, Adinkra and Batakari cloth from Ghana, country cloth from Burkina Faso, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and the wax prints that are made on the continent, also known as Ankara or Chitenge or Kitenge, depending on the region, are 100% cotton. 
This is important because cotton itself was one of the world's first agents of globalization and imperialism. Its popularity was driven by different peoples around the world being exposed to it, and through a series of factors deciding it was preferable to other fabrics. Professor Sven Becker's expansive book, Empire of Cotton, reminds us that the earliest humans wore furs and skins. During the Upper Paleolithic era from around 30,000 years ago to the Neolithic era or the Stone Age, as humans developed knowledge and technology to advance agriculture and animal husbandry, they started incorporating spun and woven uh, flax into their wardrobe. By the Bronze Age, people in the Middle East and North Africa were also weaving wool and flax together. The Bernou textile native to the Berber people of Tunisia and the Maghreb is a woolen cape that according to ek.org is set to date back to the traditional wardrobe of Berber populations before the Arab conquest. Mm. The Casa blankets of the Fulani people of Mali were also made of wool. In other parts of Africa, people were wearing fabric made from tree bark. The Buganda people of what is present day Uganda have a native textile called bark cloth that is made by beating sodden, sodden strips of the fibrous inner bark of trees from the Moresi family into sheets. Mm. Puja fabric from Zimbabwe is a twisted fiber from the inner bark of the baobab tree and also soaked to soften before being woven. This process of drenching the tree fibers is very similar to the process of making Egyptian papyrus. Mm. And considering Uganda's proximity to the ancient Nubian Empire, which shared power and knowledge with ancient Egypt, it would not be surprising if this craft was adapted and shared. Cotton is said to have entered the African wardrobe via Nubians in what is currently Eastern Sudan, who developed techniques for spinning and weaving cotton a few thousand years after it, was, it is believed that the first known manufacture of thread from cotton fibers was happening in the region that comprises present-day Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, the Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, as well as ancient Peru. Perhaps through trade and war between Nubia and between Nubia and ancient Egypt, cotton cultivation and manufacturing eventually spread to Egypt. Between 400 and 300 BC, Gujarati cotton cloth from India was being traded along the East African coast and deep into the continent. It's unknown how exactly the knowledge of how to grow and process cotton got to West Africa, but there's evidence of cotton in West Africa in the dawn, at the dawn of the first century. Islam catalyzed the spread of cotton across Africa. Becker writes, with the arrival of Islam in the 8th century CE, the cotton industry expanded significantly as Islamic teachers taught girls to spin and boys to weave, while advocating a previously unimagined modesty to peoples whose environmental conditions demanded little clothing. Becker adds, so tight was the association between Islam and cotton that most Western European languages borrowed their word for the fabric from the Arabic kutun, French cotton, English cotton, Spanish algodon, Portuguese algodão, Dutch caton, and Italian cotone, all derived from the Arabic root. This is also true of Japanese, the word for cotton is cotton, and in some African languages. In the Ghanaian language ga, the word for cotton is alududon. In Hausa, it is auduga. In Kosa, it is aikotini. And in Zulu, it is yukuti. Cotton became so part of West African life that people in what is present-day Togo planted cotton alongside yams. In mm -hmm. Ivory Coast, they interplanted it with their sorghum crops on their household farms. By the 15th century, Africa was an incredibly lucrative market for cotton merchants. There were, these were, there were trading posts across West Africa from Timbuktu in Mali to pre-colonial Burkina Faso. The town of Ada in what is present-day Ghana to Kano in Nigeria, which was known as the Manchester of West Africa. At these markets, African buyers, known for their sophisticated tex textile tastes, would shop fabrics from India and Europe, as well as from across the continent. Becker writes, one European traveler observed that African consumer tastes were most varied and capricious, and that scarcely no two villages concur in their canons of taste. By the late 16th century, there was a generations old weaving industry in Africa, with African weavers using primarily um, uh, spindles, hand spindles, to craft woven textiles. And as that European traveler complained, every group had their specific styles of weave related to their cosmology, geography, mm -hmm. tradition, and artistic sensibility. In West Africa, the woven textile known as country cloth in Burkina Faso, Guinea, Liberia, Mali, and Sierra Leone, and known in Ghana as batakari or ganja cloth, 
varied in weight, the lightness, the tightness of the loom, the pattern of the design, and the colorways, depending on which country you got it from. In my experience sourcing Batakari, this is also true regionally. Batakari from the northern region tends to be coarser with visible imperfections, as the cotton threads are dyed, are dyed in dye pits before being loomed on traditional treadles. As early as 2007, I saw a prominent male weaver and his apprentices in this region hand-stitching the cloth, which might account for the, quote, imperfect nature of northern region Batakari. Meanwhile, the Batakari in Ghana's upper west region is finer, smoother, and lighter, because weavers in this region use spools of cotton thread that are factory dyed. Not unsurprisingly, this Batakari resembles the country cloth of Burkina Faso, which shares its border, as weavers and, cus and customers have more immediate access and exposure to different styles in the border town markets. Though woven cloths are most indigenous to Africa, African fashion is argu arguably best known around the world for the cotton panels printed with intricate dye patterns. And this was perhaps most shaped by contact with and exposure to Europeans. In the 1840s, French missionaries gifted with Soto's king, Moshweshwe, some fabric, which spawned a local trend and inspired the local, te local textile pattern uh, artisans, excuse me, to create the Shweshwe fabric that is now native to South Africa. Between 1831 and 1872, Ghanaians were recruited by the Dutch to fight for the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army mm. in Indonesia, where they were exposed to and developed a taste for Javanese batik prints. In the 1880s, Dutch and Scottish traders began introducing batik prints to West Africa, known as Dutch wax prints. These fabrics became so integrated into the wardrobes of Africans all over the continent that the patterns began to reflect local iconographies and histories and captured the imagination of the people who gave specific uh, prints catchy names. Soon, local African traders were working with the Dutch and other European manufacturers to design the prints. Egyptians were using the batik um, technique to dye cloth as early as the third and 14th century BC, but it's believed in the 1960s a Peace Corps volunteer in Upper Volta, which is present-day Burkina Faso, suggested its resurgence to generate income. By the 1960s, Africans around the continent were already producing high-quality wax prints on the continent. Mm -hmm. Inexpensive imitations follow, and today cheap Chinese knockoffs flood the market, undercutting African businesses producing the higher-end textile. In so many instances, we see that the histories and evolution of the traditional African textile is in inextricably woven together with Asian and European influences through trade, colonialism, war, and migration, both forced and voluntary. Which brings me to my second point of discussion, ownership. With so much adaptation between borders and cultures, who is the rightful owner mm. of specific African textile traditions? Mm -hmm. Who, for example, oh, owns no the wax print? It was inspired by the batik of the Javanese in Indonesia, which may have been inspired by ancient Egyptian practices. It was replicated and distributed to Africa by the Dutch, who colonized them. Eventually, it was designed in collaboration with African market women to specifically cater to African tastes. And now, much of the African prints in Africa are made in China. In this scenario, who is the appropriator? The question of appropriation has become a flashpoint in contemporary discourse as a new generation grapples with a familiar power structure. Craftsmanship originated in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, co-opted by the distribution might of European and now American entities. Mm -hmm. If appropriation is essentially the, the definition of divorcing a tradition from its origins, this conversation becomes even more complicated and painful for African Americans who were ripped from their histories and cultures and enslaved, many ironically forced to pick cotton to feed the global textile trade of which Africans were known consumers. When African Americans don wax prints or mud cloth, can they be called appropriators? Can I be called an appropriator? I'm a Ghanaian American born in New York who can barely speak the languages of my mother and father, and I'm peddling cloth not woven, not even native to my heritage. I'm Fanti Ewe Nga, while Batakari is from the north. Additionally, even though I'm a woman, I don't hesitate to wear the smocks traditionally reserved for men. I remember arguing with my mother when I wanted to wear my father's smock as a mini dress a few years back. <laughs> it's just not done, she told me. And I responded, it's done now, because I'm doing this. <laughs> Which brings me to my final point, the XX factor. 
or the role gender plays in the creation of African textiles, and how who gets to wear the final garment is evolving. You recall that the Islamic teachers uh, taught girls to spin and boys to weave. And according to Becker, except among the Navajo, Hopi, and some peoples in Southeast Asia, women throughout the world have had a virtual monopoly on spinning because spinning can be done intermittently and enables a simultaneous commitment to other activities, such as watching young children and cooking. Women's roles within the household usually led them to be in charge of the spinning. With weaving, on the other hand, no, no such stark gender uh, divisions emerged. While men tended to dominate the weaving industry in places such as India and Southeast Africa, there were many cultures in which women wove as well, such as in Southeast Asia, China, and North and West Africa. Traditionally, women are the primary weavers of the Akwete cloth, native to Nigeria's Igbo people, but men weave it too. Women use a vertical loom while men use a horizontal loom. Meanwhile, the Ashoke textile, native to the Yoruba people of Nigeria, is traditionally woven by men. For Kente cloth from Ghana, I've only seen men weave it, but with Batakari, I've seen men and women weavers. In the northern region, men are the ones I've seen out front doing the business of Batakari, from on-the-spot sewing and alterations to selling the fabric, while in the Upper West region, I've seen mostly women weavers and female textile entrepreneurs. When it comes to textile dyeing, there tend to be stricter codes along gender lines. Depending on the culture, either women are prohibited from dyeing or, or dyeing is their responsibility. In the case of the Ukara woven cloth of the Igbo people, it is dyed by post-menopausal women in secret and young males in public. Women are also responsible for spinning and dyeing the Kasa Fulani um, blankets of Mali. In Nigeria's generations-old indigo textile, dyeing was traditionally the domain of the women. In her book Indigo, In Search of the Color That Seduced the World, Catherine E. McKinley notes that the concubines of the ancient Hausa kingdom of Kano were in charge of the legendary Kotar Mapa pits that date back to the late 1400s. McKinley writes, as concubines, these women surprisingly controlled the original dye pits and used indigo cloth as currency, circulating it among regional courts and the powerful. They had the power to assess state taxes, and they became the territorial representatives of the emir from the areas in which they were captured, extending their power, which they shared with their children, who under Islamic law were free and had the agency to become royals. This dominance of the women came to an end after the Kano Emirate was formed in 1805. McKinley explains that the emirs overtly pursued commercial dyeing, despite ancient ideas about indigo dyeing and its mimicking of birth and deep held taboos about male contact with the dye pot. When it came to the production of the popular adore cloth of Nigeria's Yoruba people, women also dominated what in 1936, for instance, brought a quarter of a million pounds into Yoruba land. The colonial government recognized Adire as a leading economy, which meant that women, for the first time, made significant inroads with both the colonial and the traditional structures of power. This female wealth building came to an end when the German scientist Adolf von Bayer's successful production of synthetic indigo hit the market at the end of the 1800s. In 1905, Bayer won the Nobel for his work. Reforms in government and economic realities changed the gender of mud cloth production as well. In traditional Bogolan Fini production, either men wove the cloth and women dyed it, or women, or women did all of the work, they wove and dyed it, passing the knowledge down to their daughters. But after the overthrow of Musa Traore in 1901, sorry, in 1991, unemployed young men started taking up Bogolan Fini production. Now, mud cloth is made by men and women, and the traditional year-long apprenticeships have been replaced by short and informal training sessions. Working on this lecture and reflecting on the traditions that have taken place, um, what's become clear to me is that woven into each traditional textile and everything any of us wear really, is not only human history but the human condition. Mm -hmm. Woven together with the blood and toil of the enslaved and exploited and the machinations of imperial and capitalist forces are the threads we don't see. Our human need to protect ourselves from being rejected, dismissed, chounced upon. The pride and the insecurity that compels us to broadcast our identity, our rank, our position, our origin, and our desire to consume the beauty of the natural world, namely the fur and skins of animals, the fibers of the leaves and the trees, 
and the colors that surround us yet elude us. Whether this makes us wistful or wary about clothing, it should make us hopeful. Because as we've seen, as long as humans are here, wherever in the world we are, it will continue to evolve. Thank you. Thank you.